Welcome to Cybos 2021. We're bringing the global Cybos community together online to discuss how, after major disruption, we can recharge global finance, reassess, re-energize and accelerate change to meet client, regulatory and societal demands of the future. How can we leverage digital acceleration at scale, manage unknown risks and maximize the impact of truly transformative technology while driving positive change for humanity and the planet? Without doubt, more challenges lie ahead. We're here to look to the future. With a diverse array of top speakers, new immersive sessions and interactive networking, we'll showcase the big ideas on the most pressing issues of our time. Let's connect and collaborate to discover how the financial ecosystem can emerge stronger than ever. Please welcome Chairman of the SWIFT Board, Yawa Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Cybos. I know many of us had hoped to be together in Singapore this year, but unfortunately, the pandemic is clearly still a factor affecting many aspects of our lives. We are optimistic that in 2022, we will come together again in a physical Cybos in Amsterdam. Nevertheless, Cybos still has an unmatched ability to bring all of us together across payments, securities, market infrastructures, fintechs, and big tech. In fact, a major positive of a digital experience like this is that it enables even more accessibility and inclusivity across our community. And there is clearly much to look forward to this week, more interactivity, new networking opportunities, and of course, all the phenomenal content that you expect from Cyboss. We have many great speakers and sessions this year across a wide range of topics in payments, securities, technology, and cybersecurity. We will explore a number of emerging areas from central bank digital currencies to assets of the future to identity and trust. And we will hear from many top CEOs and leaders in our industry from all corners of the world in our popular Views from the Top series. It is my privilege to welcome the first of these industry leaders to the stage, Noel Quinn, Group Chief Executive of HSBC, to give this year's opening address. Noel is a career banker, having been with HSBC and its constituent companies since 1987 and has a breadth of experience across many business lines and regions of the world, including equity finance, insurance, and commercial banking in Europe, North America, and Asia. Noel was appointed Group CEO in 2020 and is driving the digital transformation while balancing the bank's sustainability agenda. He is passionate about climate action and the impact of diversity and balance in the workplace and is sure to give many insights on the key themes we will address this week. He will be in conversation with international broadcaster, author and founder of Thinking the Unthinkable, Nick Gowing. Noah, Nick, welcome to Cyboss. Over to you. Welcome to these opening scene-setting thoughts for Cybos from Noel Quinn, Group Chief Executive of HSBC. We're meeting at the top of the HSBC headquarters, towering over the Canary Wharf business complex in the Docklands of East London. Noel, nice to see you. Despite all this disruption globally, you've had a remarkably positive few months. Uh, in August, you impressed the market with a 151% increase in profits to $10.8 billion, helped by releasing a lot of cash you'd held back. How did the bank achieve this, given the global economic stresses of COVID-19? You always said 
you never missed a beat. What do you mean by that? I think it was a very good six months. I'm really grateful to my colleagues and the way that they performed in the first six months of this year. You know, that was after a very challenging 2020. But revenue held up, even in a low interest rate environment. We had a positive performance on revenue. We had a very positive performance on ECL charges, you know, very low stage three creations or actual losses, very, very low, uh, particularly so early after an economic crisis. And we performed well on costs. It was good also to announce the sale of our French retail business and the sale of our US retail business. They were important transformation events. We delivered well on our cost savings targets. And if you think about our capital efficiency, I promised the market that we would generate 110 billion of our WA savings over a three year period. And after 18 months, we delivered savings of 85 billion. So that's great progress. So a lot of good work, but I really do want to go back to my colleagues. You know, they kept this bank running, a bank of over 200,000 people in 64 countries in the middle of a health crisis where they had to work from home. And they did that amazingly well in 2020. What did you discover about the adaptability and the flexibility of your staff, which probably you didn't know? I, what, I, what I discovered, which I sort of knew, but it was really tested, was the resilience of our people and the resilience of our operating model. And initiative. And initiative. And they, you know, the other thing we did is we realised we couldn't make all decisions from the centre. And it was, it was a great learning. You know, when you had to move fast, I mean in the space of days, in India... 40,000 of our colleagues went from working in our buildings to working at home in the space of four or five days. Now, you had to delegate, you had to empower people to get on and make things happen and run the bank and adapt market by market. We set policy at the centre, we helped where we could from the centre, but our colleagues in 64 markets made it happen. So what's the message going forward about the fact that you can still do good business, significant amounts of business, and keep the operation going in adverse conditions. Listen, we all learned a massive lesson last year, and that is in the face of adversity, you can get things done that sometimes you think you can't get done in normal market circumstances. And that's what we all did. I'll give you a classic example. In the first eight weeks, so February and March of last year, when COVID first hit the world on, a, on the world scale, we lent an incremental $41 billion in eight weeks to our corporate clients to help them navigate the liquidity pressures that existed then. We did that with our colleagues working from home and we did it digitally. We didn't do it by old fashioned face-to-face -face meetings. We did it by VC and digital uh, execution. Now, last year we had to develop websites in many of the markets we operate in to allow customers to apply for moratorium or restructuring or support government support schemes. We brought digital front ends to market in one week, where previously that may have taken three or four months. That's what I think we all learned last year. Um, and now we've got to carry that forward into the normative market that we hope we'll have for the future. Do you reckon it will be normative? It's going to be, it's going to return to some form of norm, but I think the future will but be different, different to the past. It's a different kind of norm. I think it's opened everyone's eyes as to the art of the possible. I think customers who were maybe hesitant on digital execution before are now less hesitant. Regulators that were hesitant to approve digital applications are now less hesitant. So I think the future will and actually should be different than the past pre-COVID. Nevertheless, you had 230,000 staff, you got rid of 10,000. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned about their adaptability, particularly when there is still this pressure to work from home? Yeah. I mean, you've, you've, you've done a poll about what people want to do. What is your belief going forward? Because many at this conference will be saying, yeah. what is HSBC doing? Are they going to force people back to work? Or are they going to actually find another way of working with them just as effectively to well, prove that they can still be great uh, in the banking community? Let me first of all explain the reduction in headcount that we've, that's taken place. And it isn't just turning around to people and say, please work harder because I want to reduce the headcount. It's about smart re-engineering of the business. You either pull out of business lines because you don't see them being profitable enough and therefore you reduce revenue, reduce cost, so you take activity out. Or you re-engineer processes because you've invested in technology and digitization. Um, I don't think it's as simple as just turn around to people and say I'm reducing the cost base work harder because that's unfair at times. 
In terms of going forward, very clear message from many of our colleagues. If they can have a hybrid approach, part in the office, part at home, there is a strong feeling that that's the preferred model. By so you can't force them back to the, the office? The it's not a can't. I'm just saying their, 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 their belief is 70% of them would prefer to have some form of flexibility. Now, my answer to this as a leader is I trusted my colleagues last year to run this bank working from home, and they did a great job. If I turn around to them now and say, I no longer trust you to work from home, I want you all back in the office five days a week, even if I don't need you five days a week in the office, that's a betrayal of trust. Now, I do believe in office-based work. I do believe it's great for teamwork, for creativity, for innovation, for learning. So I'd like people to be in the office, but do I need to demand that they're in there five days a week if there's no good need? No, I trust. I start there. There are some roles, however, that have to be office-based. You know, if you're a high-frequency trader, you want the technology that's available in a building like this building. If you're working in a branch, you have to be there in the branch serving clients. So this balance, it's role-based, and in my view, it's a balanced approach to the future working environment. What about the state of the global economy? How much of a wake-up call was COVID about the massive fragility massive, of our economy? Massive wake-up call. So what's and your view at the moment? For me, at the moment, I, for me, it was a big wake-up call. The global economy has just been proven to be fragile, very fragile to a natural event. We're very fortunate in an extremely difficult set of circumstances that there is a road out of that natural event. It's called the vaccines. There may not be a return path out of a natural climate event. So, you know, we have to wake up to the fact that sustainability, and it's a wake-up call for us all, has to take a more prominent role going forward than maybe it has done in the past. What kind of recalculations are you making in your own mind with, and passing on to those working for you about risk and vulnerability now? So I look at it the other way around, and this is not the optimist in me. This is actually a very analytical approach. We've been around for 156 years as an organization. In that 156 years, we have seen the industrial landscape of the world change dramatically many times. I honestly believe we're about to see that same revolution, change, take place, and it will take place in the next 10 to 15 years. Because of? Industries will have to replatform their technology base. Industries will have to transform their business models. Carbon heavy industries, carbon heavy business models are gonna to have to migrate to carbon light or carbon neutral. That will require a significant amount of investment. So I look at this, not through the risk lens first, but through the opportunity lens. This is an opportunity for us as an institution with our footprint in, in the emerging markets that has to go through so much change to be part of that change and to lead that change. We'll talk about sustainability and the climate emergency shortly, but what about geopolitics? Where does a bank position itself now, given the uncertainty you have said already that this, you don't pretend that this is easy. Yeah. Where do you, not just because you're a bank, you're a major corporate, how do you position yourself, particularly when uh, decisions are being taken by some countries about sanctions, for example? Yeah. Where do you come into that? Well, if you're an international bank and you want to be global, it's a fact of life that you have to comply and operate within a complex geopolitical world. I mean, it's particularly complex at this point in time, but it has been many times in our history over the last 156 years. But being a global international bank is not an easy business model, but our clients are saying to us, and this is where I always reference, our clients still want to be international. They still have needs on a global basis, and they're asking us to help them with those needs. So my job is to help this organization navigate those geopolitics, be very focused on helping our clients navigate their business model needs and remaining focused on the long term, not just the short term. Is your assessment of the assessment of your chief risk officers and others here that actually this is now becoming incredibly complex with multitude of problems 
in almost every corner of the world now, which means that it's going to be even more difficult for you as a bank. No, um, I think we, we acknowledge, actually, if you think about sanctions laws, they've been around and with us now for many years, and they're complex. And as an international bank, you have to comply with them. Um, there have been many incidents over the past 10 or 20 years that have been politically challenging, geopolitically. This is a new phase of it. Um, but we believe we can navigate it. We have navigated it successfully thus far, and we will continue to do so. Does a government ask you if they want to impose sanctions on a country? No. Do, do they no. consult you and say, no. can you make this work? <laughs> no, that, isn't, that does not happen, and I wouldn't so expect it to happen. So you read the breaking happen. news like everyone else? That, that, yes. We, sanctions is a matter of government policy, along with other, other government policies. And we know we're not consulted on that, but we have an obligation to comply. Do you position yourself politically at all in the world, do you think? We try not to. We try and position ourselves as an organisation that serves clients, that tries to help communities develop, that tries to help economies to develop, and to help economies connect. You know, we, we've been around for 156 years bridging East and West. We still believe there's a need to bridge East and West uh, from a, co a corporate point of view and from a, a trading point of view. Um, and that's very much the message I get from my clients. We've been through terrible times with COVID, and it's not over, but the climate emergency is, is coming down on us at a rate of knots, at like, a, like an express train. Uh, you've, talk, you've said we might not be so lucky with the climate crisis. It's noticeable coming up here to the top floor of your building here in East London that you've got signs up every, everywhere saying transition to net zero. Yeah. How are you positioning yourself, your thinking, and the bank and everyone working for it about what is now looming on the climate emergency and what role you'll take? Our role is one of facilitation, as ever. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to overstate our place in life. Our place in life is to help our clients achieve their ambitions. But you can also guide them. We can. And point them. And we can help them and facilitate and make it become a reality. And that's what I want to do. And educate them. And educate, but we all have a responsibility to educate each other. You know, they need to educate me on their plans for the future and their technologies and their challenges, and we need to help them make the finance become available. But let me go back. The first, and for, the, the first objective is to help our clients transition from their current business model to a more sustainable one. If we do that, then our balance sheet transitions. There are certain stakeholders that would suggest I should just reposition my balance sheet withdraw from fossil fuels, withdraw from certain industry segments. And I say, I could do that, and then my balance sheet looks good, nicely sustainable. But I haven't changed the world. I haven't helped those clients move their businesses into a net zero business model. So my first response is to have dialogue with the clients, understand their investment plans, and help those investment plans become a reality so that they be can become net zero by 2050. That's how I'm trying to achieve our responsibility in today's world. There was, though, a sinister figure literally about a month ago from the UNFCCC. It's no longer just about 1.5 degree. It's now about 2.7 degree. That's where it looks like we're heading. What does that mean for you as the group chief executive of a major bank about how there's an even greater urgency? And I sense that urgency, Nick. I do. I, and I, I, I'm... I'm an optimist in this regard. I believe the pace of change in the last 18 months, two years, has been such that I think there's an awful lot of change to come in the near term. At times it doesn't feel like it, but if I look at the dialogue I'm having, I, 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 I see what's taking place in the industry forums I'm in, in the dialogue I'm having with my clients, I think there's a huge amount of change about to come. And it's not beyond our ability to achieve the 1.5%, we're not too late, but we have a lot of work to do. And I'm optimistic that the world is rallying behind that objective. Do they realize it, do you think? Yeah, they do. Honestly, I, that's, not, that's not a party line, that's not a strap line. That I genuinely believe that governments and businesses and the banking sector and the financial services sector are all committed to making this become a reality. Because John Kerry describes it as the need for a wartime mentality now, because the urgency is so great, 
and we've achieved maybe 55% of what's achievable, we've still got to achieve another 45%. Yeah. That's an enormous lift. It is an enormous lift, but I've seen those sort of lifts in the past. We saw those sort of lifts last year with the way the world responded. You know, you go back to COVID, when those first discussions were taking place, everybody thought it would take three years to achieve a vaccine, two to three years. And the scientists did an amazing job. They did it in 12 months. I still believe we have collectively the capacity to really accelerate the change, to achieve the sustainability objectives. And I sense that urgency in the dialogue I'm having with my clients and stakeholders. How much does that mean having a rather different relationship with your customers? In other words, virtually saying to them, if they're hovering or laggards or dragging their feet, you've got to realize there is no other way forward and we are going to help you on this. Yes, that's fine. But I'm also sensing that from my clients. They're saying to me, help us on this journey. And that's the oil and gas sector, the automotive sector. There's a huge amount of change in the pipeline that's coming down the track and I'm very confident that we can collectively make it happen. What do you think the banking sector must do about high carbon emitting sectors and how they need to transition? Do you stop literally funding them? No, I don't think that's the first answer. I think the first answer is help them transition off of those high carbon emitting business models onto alternative technologies and alternative sources of energy, alternative sources of transportation. And there are technological solutions there in development that need to be brought to scale. You know, long haul flights, classic example. There is a solution there for a significant amount of carbon reduction in the use of sustainable aviation fuels. You know, I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is an 80% reduction in the carbon footprint of a long haul flight if we had SAF. Now, SAF is technologically proven. It's been tested in the planes, it's operating in planes. We haven't got the refining capacity today to create enough SAF. Well, we can build that refining capacity collectively and we can fund the build of that. What we need is to make it happen. And then you can have a material impact on the carbon footprint of the airline industry. Do you as a major global bank, though, walk away from certain sectors now? Or do you find a way of funding a transition, even if they're reluctant to go down that track? My preference is to fund the transition. You resort to the, you know, because I've given commitments about my balance sheet and how it will look in 2050. In the event that you're having a dialogue with somebody that is reluctant to go in that direction, then of course you've got to reserve that option of moving away from that particular client if they're not willing to go down the sustainability path. But you don't start there. You start there on trying to work with them on a transition. What about internally within the bank, um, within HSBC, the survey that you did, which you initiated, the four pillars which emerged, what have you learned about culture and mindset and actually what your staff really wanted, which perhaps in some ways surprised you, even though it reassured you in the end? Well, the first thing, it was a great exercise because this was about the purpose and values of HSBC. And, you know, we've been around for 156 years, so... We're not starting from a blank sheet of paper, but we reached out to thousands and thousands of colleagues and customers, and we got their views. And the reassure, reassuring thing was a lot of the feedback we got on the core purpose of this organization around you know, helping entrepreneurs achieve their ambitions, to open up an international world of opportunity for those businesses, to help individuals and families develop the opportunities for them to progress there was a strong feedback from our clients and our people that that energizes them and that excites them. Was it more radical than you expected? No, it, that in its sense, the opening up a world of opportunity was confirmation. But actually, those words came from them. They didn't come from me or the executive team at the top. And I found them, as soon as I heard them, I said, that's it. I've been searching for those words for years and I've never been good enough to come up with the phrase. Because too often we talked about internationalism and it wasn't inclusive enough as a statement. Whereas opening up a world of opportunity speaks to a UK only customer who's trying to improve the world for their family. 
where he speaks to a domestic UK business or a Hong Kong domestic business who just wants to get bigger in their own market. But it also speaks to international opportunity as well. So it was a far better articulation than anything I could have drafted. So you learned something. In other words, is there a message from the HSBC experience yeah. to other corporates and others watching yeah. this at the conference? Don't think you have to invent it at the centre. Sometimes mm. what comes to you from your, your engagement process with clients and staff will give you far more insight than just trying to think you've got the answer. Then on the values, um, there was strong messages that so much of what we have been over our history, they wanted to retain. That principle of integrity, of teamwork, of diversity and, and, and inclusivity. So they wanted that to continue. But I got it loud and clear from them, and I felt it myself. We wanted a fourth statement, and that was the get it done. And that was about HSBC. Get it done. Take, take the good ideas and the dialogue and turn it into a reality, execute. That was the loud and clear message coming through. And that's why we didn't have three statements, we had four. We had three that were rooted in our heritage and we had one that spoke out very loudly and said, let's execute, get it done, stop talking about it. One final thought on sustainability before we move on to the task force and what the work you're doing there. It's not just about the big corporates. It's about every single bit of business activity, including the smallest possible totally. banks, many of whom are your customers. How much do you fear that the SME population around the world is going to be slightly ignored in all of this when they are fundamentally important for the whole forward movement of all of this? And that's absolutely spot on because for so many large manufacturers, if they're going to re-engineer their carbon footprint, they have to re-engineer their supply chain. And it's the SMEs of the world and the mid-market corporates of the world that are going to have to be part and parcel of that journey of transition. And they need financial support for them to transition. Um, so absolutely the SMEs have got to be included, large and small. Um, and that is really where we're, we're focused as HSBC. That's our heritage, banking, entrepreneurial businesses particularly in the emerging markets, particularly those involved in the supply chain to the very large manufacturers of the world. That's why I think we have a natural ability to facilitate the transition to net zero. Let's talk about the task force for financial services building to COP26, which you are chairing yeah. with other top banks. You can't tell us exactly what's going to be in it. It's still being discussed. It's going to be published shortly before COP26. But what are the main principles which are emerging? Because this is extraordinary, the fact that you're hoping to find some kind of consensus yeah. between financial institutions about the way forward at a time like this. Yeah, and, and what we did is we, we tried to keep it as a, a relatively, relatively small group of banks to start with to brainstorm potential solutions. So... There's 11 of us that meet on a regular basis, have been doing so now for about a year, under the guidance of uh, His Royal Highness's SMI initiative. It's the Financial Services Task Force. And we're looking at two or three areas that I think are important. First, if as a bank, you want to make a statement to the world that you're transitioning to net zero by 2050, and you will want to avoid that statement being just a marketing strap line or being misunderstood, then you need to bring definition to what that really means. And you need to bring transparency to what that means. How are you going to disclose today your current carbon footprint of your banking activities, not just of your operations, but your finance activities? How are you going to set targets for how you're going to transition your current footprint to a more sustainable one? How are you going to do that based on science as opposed to hope or arbitrary objectives? How are you going to disclose that to the world so that the stakeholders understand what it is you're saying? And what we've developed is a white paper, a document that sets out an architecture of that if you want to use the statement transition to net zero as a bank, here are some of the fundamental principles of what you should put in place to convince the world that you're doing that with substance and you're doing it transparently and that you are going to bring them on that journey with you so that you're not disbelieved, you're believed.
It's about data, in other words. It's about data, it's about disclosure, it's about transparency. It's about rooting it in science, and it's about having objectivity. So the second initiative is Fast Infra. Um, and that's not just the 11 banks, there's about 100 institutions being consulted on that. And we're trying to develop a label that helps the investors in the world understand what projects to invest in and are those projects sustainable. So first and foremost, it's definition of sustainable infrastructure investment. The second objective in that project is to then socialize those projects through a platform that allows projects to be funded by the supply of investors around the world. And this is important because many of those projects are in the emerging markets. Not all of them, but many. And the investors are in the developed world. And therefore, transparency on what is a sustainable project and then sharing information and data about those projects on a global basis should facilitate the matching of the supply of funds to the demand for funds. It's that easy, is it? No, it's not that easy, but I do believe we have an architecture and a proposal that solves, will go a long way to solving that problem. And it'll be readily accepted? There's been strong consultation, wide consultation, and the consultation has been positive. Let me pick up finally on a couple of points about wealth. Yep. Where is wealth being generated now, particularly what you're seeing in the People's Republic of China, of, about where wealth is now emerging in the cities? Yeah. And what you're seeing about the definition of wealth, because you are wealth managers at HSBC. Yeah. So that then asks the question, what is wealth? It's not just the supremely rich. No, it's not. It's, it's another generation which is emerging. No, that is too narrow a definition to just talk about the super rich. You know, if you think about our history uh, and where we operate in the UK and in Hong Kong and other markets, it's as much about the mass affluent, it's much about the emerging middle class as it is about the super rich. Fast emerging. Fast emerging. And if you think about China, it is fast emerging. If you think about the urbanization that has taken place in China and, you know, the 75 plus cities with more than one million population, and you think about their GDP growth curve, you know, their GDP growth curve in many of those cities is moving towards the $12,000 12, per GDP per head per capita. And at that point, those markets become consumption markets. That's the point when they start to want to buy financial services products, like insurance, like investment products. So I'm as interested in that opportunity in China, if not more so than I am interested in the super rich, because that is where you tap into the underlying economic growth of a market. That's my definition of wealth management. What about the redefinition of money and, and, and wealth and the way particularly the next generation are viewing what a banking service is, particularly yeah. with digital services yeah. and how that's emerged. You can now you can now buy a coffee or you buy a bar of chocolate with a, with a, with a, with a bit of plastic. Yeah. And presumably that's going to be disappearing yeah. quite soon as well. Where are we heading and how fast? Well, listen, there are hard currencies of the world and those hard currencies of the world typically move more digitally today than they do by paper. So, you know, if you think about my own business, we're one of the biggest movers of money around the world in the, in the market. And 95% of all of that money that we move is done digitally today. Now, there are the emergence of alternative digital currencies. So the broader definition of digital currencies. Um, and they take many forms, you know, one of them is crypto, the other are stable coins, and then you've got the central bank-backed currencies. But you're not keen on crypto, are you? And I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm keen on being part of the journey on digital currencies, but I have two criteria that are important. Uh, so this is not a question necessarily about crypto, it's about the two criteria. For a digital currency, particularly for an international bank like ours to work, there probably needs to be two, two attributes that are important. Transparency and convertibility. What do I mean by that? You want to know who the counterparties are. You want to know who the buyer and the seller is. And if there are any intermediaries, you need to be understanding of the intermediaries. If you can't do that, you have a problem with financial crime compliance. You can't do that in hard currency. So to be able to, to facilitate a payment system, particularly a cross-border payment system, where you don't have transparency of counterparties, you have a compliance challenge. Second, 
convertibility. There are certain digital currencies that have been talked about that are being put forward as asset classes. Well, highly volatile asset classes are okay for certain clients, but not for all clients. So you have a conduct issue if you're promoting an asset class, i.e. a digital currency or a crypto, to a client where that volatility level is unsuitable for them. So I look at digital currencies not through a fixed lens, but I want to understand how those digital currencies are going to operate on those two attributes. Final thought, if I may, Noel. Um, if we'd been talking 18 months ago, we wouldn't have been talking about a pandemic. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have been seeing some of the awful stuff that's happened since. What is on your mind quickly about what might be coming, not in 18 years, but in 18 months or even 18 weeks? And are you ready for it? Nick, that's a great question. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a risk manager. I lead a financial services company, and you've got to be cognizant of risk. Uh, my, my philosophy in the past has always been the risk you know about, you can deal with. You can manage it. You analyze it. You understand it. You build plans. You're always paranoid about the risk you don't yet know about, the event that hasn't yet happened, and you're trying to predict it. And it's very hard to do that, and it's very hard to plan for it. But that is absolutely what we as organizations have to do. Now, it was a very tough 18 months, the last 18 months, not just for us, but for the whole financial services sector and for governments. And I think they responded well to it. None of us were perfect. We all wish we could have done things differently. But collectively, I think it was a very powerful response to a very unpredictable event. Um, and I'm sure, collectively, we'll do the same again for the next unpredictable event. Noel Quinn, thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome back, SWIFT Chairman Yawa Shah. Thank you, Noel, for those insightful remarks. They really have set the tone for the week ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, it is once again my honor and privilege to be with you to provide an update on your cooperative, alongside some observations about our industry. Today, as is my tradition, I will cover three themes. First, strategic alignment. This is a responsibility that SWIFT shares with the community to create a bank-centric vision of the future. Secondly, I will cover delivery and adoption. Here I'll talk about how SWIFT is working to equip the community with the right services to propel each and every one of your businesses forward, and how we all need to leverage this. Finally, I will talk about responsible finance and the importance of doing all of this with a strong focus on risk and control. Now let me take each of these in turn. First, strategic alignment. Those of you who know me know that I've been doing this in the industry for a while now, across payments, securities, and compliance, and I've never been more energized. Innovation is at an all-time high in the financial services industry, and there's a profound sense of excitement. Why? There are a number of forces at work. There is tremendous demand in the marketplace for what we do across payments and securities processing. The world changed in many ways because of COVID. And in our industry, one of the lasting impacts is a quantum shift to digital. The volume of non-cash transactions is forecasted to grow double digits in the coming years. And depending on which consultant reports you read, Total payments revenue could rise by half a trillion U.S. dollars by the end of the decade. Of course, this is attracting lots of interest from the investment community, particularly as companies try to address changing customer needs and remove friction points. Private equity and venture capital is pouring into this space, and mergers and acquisitions are taking place at a blistering pace as established firms buy new capabilities and new startups scale. 
we are looking at an incredibly vibrant ecosystem that, yes, can be potentially disruptive for banks and SWIFT, but is also full of opportunity. And your SWIFT is right at the heart of it. Never has SWIFT been offered so many avenues of growth. As you would expect, we are active in numerous proofs of concept with explorations, with banks, market infrastructures, fintechs, technology providers, and more as we shape the future together. We have a constant eye on the horizon. For example, we are looking at emerging areas and trends like cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance so that we can anticipate what they mean for our global community. SWIFT is committed to enabling a bank-centric ecosystem in cross-border account-to-account transaction management, providing best-in-class back-end infrastructure so you, all of you, can provide best-in-class services to your customers. As a global, neutral cooperative, SWIFT serves all communities from the largest global transaction banks to the small and mid-sized institutions that represent so many of our members. That focus on the broad community is core to what we are. That brings me to my second point, delivery and adoption. SWIFT is working across multiple fronts, payments, securities, and financial crime compliance, to name just a few, in order to put in place the pillars for the future. These pillars are built on a strong foundation of security, reliability, and resilience. These things are fundamental to the trust you put in us. So what does this all mean? It means supporting you on the migration to ISO 20022. The rich data standard enables innovative services, better customer experiences, and fewer processing exceptions. You recognize the importance of the community moving together and the reality that everyone could not move at once. Because this is a big lift. And that's where SWIFT is playing a role, enabling a seamless transition to ISO 2022 in line with the industry's decision and adoption timeframe through 2025. We are building capabilities to facilitate translation between ISO 2022 messages and MT. That way, Early adopters of the standard can immediately realize its benefits, and those that need to take more time can go at their own pace. But let me be clear, this is not just a compliance exercise. There is tremendous strategic value for banks in moving to ISO 20022. Rich data enables higher levels of automation, creating opportunities to cut costs, reduce risks, and grow revenues. They range from operational cost reductions through savings in collateral and capital to broadening the range of services available to customers. SWIFT understands this, and we have prioritized translation capabilities for the community to help navigate through the transition period. We remain fully committed to driving a vastly improved rich data standard across the community in the years to come. But that is not all. In parallel, I repeat, in parallel, SWIFT is creating a new transaction manager that will leverage rich data to orchestrate flows for a seamless experience. This is transformational. It represents a shift from sequential messaging to full transaction management, and a step change for cross-border payments and securities processing across SWIFT. What does this mean for payments? It means SWIFT will enable you to have end-to-end -end transactions that are instant and frictionless. And in securities, SWIFT will help you create processes that are even more efficient, transparent, and less complex. SWIFT has a strong coalition of the willing who continue to provide support and guidance to ensure strong alignment with the community's needs. And SWIFT will be delivering new capabilities at speed. In payments, SwiftGo and payments pre-validation have recently gone live. SwiftGo is a new service that helps financial institutions improve the experience for small and mid-sized businesses and consumers who send low-value cross-border payments. It enables these banks' customers to move faster, easier, and more competitively priced payments around the world. 
SWIFT's pre-validation service enables real-time payment validation to reduce errors, exceptions, and costs caused by wrong or missing beneficiary information. It supports the strategy for instant and frictionless transactions. And in the months ahead, we plan to continue innovating the service. I could go on and on with examples in payments, securities, and financial crime compliance. But instead, what I want to emphasize is that SWIFT needs to continue to deliver and execute with speed and discipline. This brings me to my final point, responsible finance. Everything we do is about enabling our industry to be compliant, to manage risk well, and to continually raise the bar on security. Within SWIFT, business strategy, delivery, and risk and control have equal priority. We continue to deliver responsibly with a clear risk management process and with a controlled activation plan for the new platform that the community can trust. We have strong governance through our board. And as you know, we are overseen by the G10 central banks, which we respect. That is what it means to innovate responsibly. To lean in hard on the future while maintaining due care on security, reliability, and resilience. And it's important that as the industry continues to evolve, as services and players expand, which is good because it makes us all better, everyone is held to the same rigor. SWIFT provides the tools to keep member institutions secure and compliant as well. The customer security program is instrumental in helping our community protect itself from cyber attack. And tools such as the Payments Control Service and daily validation reports are critical in identifying suspicious activity. As a global and trusted cooperative, SWIFT is in a unique position to support you on these critical fronts. In conclusion, all of this work helps preserve the strength and integrity of the global financial system. I would like to thank the SWIFT board for its strong and active governance during this period of strategic delivery and against the pandemic backdrop. All organizations everywhere have had to adapt, including SWIFT and our community. And we continue to, recognizing that we must do so with respect and empathy for the human toll. I'm grateful for the board's expertise during this period, as well as engagement from experts in the community and major global transaction banks, who all bring a wealth of insights and experience that benefits the entire SWIFT community, and to the national member groups as well for their active support and engagement. They are at the heart of the community and ensure all voices are heard. And of course, I want to thank the executive team and the entire SWIFT staff for their continued hard work and dedication during this challenging period of the pandemic and thank them in anticipation for their accelerated delivery in the future. Before I hand over to Javier, let me share one last thought. People often ask me what the future looks like for SWIFT as an incumbent in an environment of innovation and disruption. Here's what I tell them. SWIFT has and will continue to deliver with responsible innovation. It has the support of the global banking community. It has strong oversight and talented staff and the financial resources needed to invest. It is well known that we have been doing this for a long time, and I say, we're just getting started. It is my honor and privilege to serve as chairman of the board, and I thank you for your ongoing support and engagement. Javier, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So here we are at our second digital edition of Cybos. I wish we could all see each other again, especially because it's been difficult times and a couple of years now since we last came together. But for now, obviously, digital is still the safest way we can bring the event to you. And I am optimistic that we'll be back together again soon. Clearly, we've all gone digital in a big way in our daily lives. Of course, working from home, but also with habits such as Netflix, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, and catch-ups with family on Zoom that have become the norm. And we've also seen accelerated change in the business environment too. As Noel Quinn mentioned, 
The financial services industry is definitely not an exception. It has actually really impressed me how the industry as a whole has not only maintained business as usual, but has also got great momentum on its own transformation. The industry has been on a massive digital journey. And if anything, with a much bigger sense of purpose and responsibility. Because a lot of this innovation is about the efficiency and transparency of financial services. And it is also about inclusivity in reaching the unbanked, climate and sustainability, and of course, diversity and inclusion. I truly believe that this attention across our industry, and of course, SWIFT included, will help us to perform and serve customers better and in a more sustainable way in the long term. The classic industry narrative of a big part of the last decade was always polarized into a kind of a hero versus villain conversation about, on the one hand, incumbents having to overcome the constraints of legacy systems, and on the other hand, fintechs leveraging new technologies to power fully digital services. But now, incumbent players across payments and securities have stepped up to the plate with new services that are game-changing, with much greater customer experience and increased speed and transparency. A good example in the payment space is GPI, as Yawar just mentioned, where SWIFT has transformed the international payments experience. Almost half of all SWIFT payments today are credited within five minutes, and not just to the receiving bank, by the way, but to the end beneficiaries and about two-thirds within 30 minutes. The reality of this transformation is pretty telling. And as we look ahead, it is really encouraging to see the industry as a whole taking ownership of the next stages of the journey collectively to tackle the remaining challenges on speed, cost, transparency and inclusivity. And that includes central banks' involvement in the FSB CPMI three-stage process, now tackling important areas such as the interlinking of domestic payment systems, as well as innovations such as stable coins or CBDCs. Which is, by the way, exactly what SWIFT is also looking at in our own CBDCs experiments. And what is reassuring is that together with commercial banks, market infrastructures and central banks, we are innovating whilst maintaining the strong guardrails around compliance, cyber, data security and liquidity management. And that's where SWIFT's responsible innovation comes in. Let me tell you what we're up to because we've been delivering at pace. This time last year, I talked about our plans to move beyond our traditional high-value segments to enable fast and competitive SME and consumer payments over SWIFT. Well, a couple of months ago, we've made that happen with SWIFT Go, which is a real game-changer to help the banks become even more competitive by offering their customers more appealing services. This means fast, transparent and cost-effective international payments and remittances with a simple click from banks' own customer channels that forward-looking and agile institutions are able to implement today. So whether you're moving money to family in your home country, or you're traveling, post-pandemic of course, for a hot dog in New York, a croissant in Paris, or you've made a small business payment in Nairobi, SWIFT may well be powering your bank to offer you a fast and cheap international payment experience through the app on your phone. And one of the other frictions that we've tackled across the board is the challenge of not having the right account data. So we've also introduced new services to make sure that all the data is correctly pre-validated at the point of creation. We've brought this to market very fast in response to the industry's needs. And this is just the beginning. We are full speed ahead on our platform transformation to deliver instant and frictionless transactions account to account anywhere in the world. And this is not only upgrading the rails for the interbank part of the journey, it is also about leveraging the bank's entry points into domestic systems to interlink market infrastructures worldwide. Because that's the way we will achieve a true end-to-end -end vision with the potential of seamlessly connecting up to 4 billion accounts around the world. And this, while of course also continuing to support the risk and control fundamentals through responsible innovation. Next year, we introduce a major deliverable in our journey with our new API-driven transaction manager that lies at the heart of our vision. And once the transaction manager is in full force, when we promise instant, we will really deliver instant. Also embedding into the process data services such as sanction screening, anomaly detection, data analytics, tracking, and exception management. And the line all of this, ISO 2022 rich data is the foundation. The transaction manager will be available for those who have migrated to ISO 2022, but we're also making sure nobody gets left behind 
by introducing inflow translation, which is, by the way, ahead of schedule and already available for testing as of November this year. This gives our customers ample time for testing, and it also means that everyone can migrate to ISO 222 at their own pace and take advantage, therefore, of the transaction manager after that. And it is also worth mentioning that the transaction manager will be currency agnostic, so that if CBDCs or stable coins are adopted by the industry, we can adapt, facilitating interoperability between token-based and account-based networks. And down the line, by creating the platform of platforms, strategic partners who are innovating in different segments can plug in to introduce new forms of value across the ecosystem. While this back-end transformation of our industry may not be immediately visible, the difference between those who get it right and those who don't can have consequences. Appealing front-end apps may only tell half of the story when it comes to resilience, reliability, consumer protection and full compliance. As far as we're concerned at Swift, we deliver faster than ever, but we don't take shortcuts because we are not about short-term gain or profit. And you all know, operational excellence is in our DNA. It is precisely because we are industry-owned with global scale that we can innovate and create the next generation foundations responsibly. And that is differentiating us as a cooperative. We're going to power an even more inclusive global economy that works faster, smarter and better for businesses of all sizes and the people and economies they serve. From next year, the landscape will be very different and today's problems will be becoming a thing of the past. Right now, I know we're asking a lot from you. Adopting APIs and new services and upgrading your back office infrastructures to new standards. But this is not just a tick-the-box exercise. This is a join-up vision with many different components, and the whole is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. But we cannot do this alone. We count on you to adopt these innovations, and we're here to support you every step of the way. We're transforming the foundations for the whole industry for decades to come. And speaking personally, even with all the constraints of leading through the pandemic, it is really motivating to work on building that future together. Because this is much more than a vision. It is becoming the new reality. Thank you, and I wish you all a great Cybus. Behind every transaction is a story. Transactions that build businesses, strengthen economies, and improve lives. At Swift, we're making these transactions faster, smarter, better. Delivering new services that increase predictability and speed, reduce friction and costs, and power a more inclusive global economy. Together with our community, we are reimagining how our industry operates, capitalizing on rich data, and collaborating with the brightest minds in technology and beyond to unlock a world of new opportunities. We are transforming the Swift platform to enable instant, frictionless transactions from one account to another, anywhere in the world, and give you the capabilities you need to enable bold new possibilities for your customers. Possibilities like quick and easy, low-value cross-border payments for small businesses and consumers. Payment pre-validation that ensures straight-through processing, end-to-end -end tracking for securities, and instant and predictive treasury services for corporates. These innovations and more will help our community thrive today and in the future, especially if we develop them together and adopt them as one. That's why we're inviting you to be part of this journey and be part of shaping the future of finance. Faster, smarter, better.